So um, before I, I jump in, just a uh, content warning. Um, I will be discussing, I will be quoting extensively and displaying uh, various racist and anti-Semitic uh, statements and imagery. Um, so I just putting that uh, content warning there um, for this topic. Okay, so um, one thing that got me uh, interested in this topic specifically uh, were uh, events from the beginning of this year. Uh, before I came to Brandeis, I worked at Xavier University in Cincinnati. And uh, uh, at the beginning of February uh, of uh, this year, uh, there was an attack on the Xavier campus by uh, a white nationalist group called Patriot Front. Uh, they put up various propaganda stickers and they defaced uh, Black Lives Matter signage uh, and, and all of that. Uh, and they put up stickers like this uh, that includes uh, the fascist symbol there uh, combined with um, traditional symbols of uh, the United States. Uh, and in response to that incident, uh, I was teaching a uh, Roman Empire class at the time. Uh, and we already learned about the uh, fascists used by the lictors in the Roman Republic and then into the empire. Uh, and we talked about how uh, these white nationalist groups uh, incorporate uh, the fascists uh, for their purposes. Uh, and we also looked at uh, how uh, groups like Patriot Front uh, look, uh, use the history of uh, the Roman Republic and empire uh, and take inspiration from it. Okay, so Patriot Front has uh, from their website, uh, they have quotes such as this, uh, they say that, uh, the American Republic is a failed experiment in that democracy uh, is, uh, is obsolete. Uh, and so just as the Roman Republic collapsed uh, and uh, you know, the Caesars came about, uh, this needs to happen in the United States of America. And again, this was published uh, around the time that Donald Trump was elected. Okay. Um, and this type of uh, taking inspiration from uh, the Roman Empire and this uh, wish to see something like the Roman Empire uh, reborn uh, is really mainstream in uh, far right thought, uh, you know, in this country and throughout the world. Um, and it certainly was held by the far right, alt right icon Richard Spencer. Okay, so at a conference in Nashville in 2013, he essentially uh, looked at the Roman Empire as he saw it um, as the model of a white ethno state that he wishes uh, to be imposed on the North American continent. Okay. Uh, he says that uh, much like Patriot Front, he says that equality and democracy are uh, untenable uh, values and institutions and that we need to import, we need to impose a white ethno state to rival the ancients. So they're very much looking at uh, Greece and Rome uh, as um, viable uh, uh, models uh, for white ethno states. Okay. Uh, and so in the field of classics, um, there's been great work by uh, individuals such as uh, Curtis Dozier, who runs the site Pharos, uh, which documents and deconstructs uh, various uh, appropriations of classical antiquity uh, by uh, the far right, uh, and uh, that attack on Xavier occurred not not even a month after the Capitol insurrection on January 6th, in which uh, various participants uh, were putting on Corinthian helmets uh, and seeing themselves uh, as uh, Spartans reborn, waving flags that said Molin Labe, uh, as well as uh, signs that uh, essentially equated uh, Donald Trump with Julius Caesar uh, crossing the Rubicon and overthrowing the Republic. Um, and those who are in the uh, heavy metal side of things uh, will know where I was going with this. Um, one of the participants in the Capitol insurrection was the guitarist and lead songwriter of the rather popular heavy American heavy metal band from Indiana called Iced Earth. Uh, and uh, he is now, I believe, uh, facing uh, charges. Um, but uh, this was a great revelation to a lot of people in the metal scene uh, that this person, um, you know, was found out to be having uh, taken part in this. Um, but uh, if you look at some of the lyrics, especially of his side project, uh, Sons of Liberty, um, going back to uh, this song from 2011, um, you'll see that, uh, you know, he was buying in to a lot of these ideas. In fact, uh, Sons of Liberty, uh, taken in total, 
uh, is a, you could call it a right wing conspiracy themed metal band. It includes this song called Molen Labe. Uh, and if you look at the lyrics, you can see that uh, Schaefer was essentially watched the movie 300 and then wrote a song about it. A, um, <clears throat> and uh, so we can very much see how he fits in to uh, the capital insurrection and um, you know its connections to the imagery of antiquity. A uh, someone who, um, now with the capital insurrection, you know, there's this kind of conception that the people who took part in that were represented sort of uh, stereotypes of you know uneducated bigots from certain parts of the country uh, and who are just watching a Hollywood movie or Fox News in order to get. Uh, ideas of their politics or um, or their conceptions of antiquity. Uh, and that may be so for some of them, but um, I don't think it was all. And I think there were there are plenty of people who may have been in, at the riot, but also uh, among the far right intelligentsia who are very well educated, well read, and they know their classics uh, and they are using this knowledge uh, for nefarious purposes. Um, and so one thing that we can look at here is in connection to heavy metal is uh, a speech in Helsinki, Finland by uh, Greg Johnson, who was, who was a far right uh, thought leader uh, and founder of the far right magazine uh, Countercurrents. Uh, and he begins this speech, it's a short speech, uh, with a quotation of Homer's Iliad. Uh, and what he's essentially doing at the beginning of the speech is he is appealing to uh, Achilles' sense of anger and resentment and fighting spirit, his thumos, a, uh, that turned destructive uh, when he was dishonored by Agamemnon. He's and he's essentially telling his audience that we need that white Europeans need to reharness that thumos, that spirit, that resentment, uh, and direct it against. Uh, you know, refugees and multiculturalism and uh, the left, um, much as Achilles, uh, you know, responded to Agamemnon. Okay. What does this have to do with metal? Well, at the very end of the speech, he returned to this concept uh, and essentially identified his audience as receptive to this rhetoric where uh, he's essentially saying that uh, the far right uh, cannot win a war of words alone. A, with reasoned argument. Uh, what we need to do, or what he says that they need to do is uh, appeal to sentiment, appeal to thumos, okay? So the spirited element of the Plato's tripartite soul in the Republic uh, and uh, harness that in order to reclaim um, their, uh, to reclaim Europe essentially. Uh, and then he looked at his audience and said, there is surely no shortage of thumos in Finland, the land of black metal, okay? Uh, and so Greg Johnson recognized, okay, in the genre of black metal, okay, uh, which is a subgenre of metal that I'll talk about plenty uh, in, this, in this talk, uh, he saw that this was a brand of music uh, that channeled Thumas. It was music that was centered on feelings of rage and hate and misanthropy. Okay? And uh, he saw that in Finland, there is a very high concentration of not just metal bands, but black metal bands, as well as what I'll talk about, national socialist black metal bands. So this leads us to a couple of essential questions that I want to address for the rest of this talk. Um, and uh, this grows out of kind of a conversation about that's related to, you know, what is it about classics, the discipline of classics that makes it attractive to fascist and racist ideologies. But we could also ask that question about heavy metal music, its scenes and its history that makes it an attractive medium not only for Greco-Roman antiquity, but also for fascist and racist ideologies. Okay? And uh, there's a lot of similarities in why uh, it is uh, an attractive medium for both. Okay? So I will try very quickly to establish a little context of uh, a brief history of heavy metal to, in order to kind of foreground uh, where I'm going with some of my analyses of bands that appropriate classical antiquity. Um, so, um, this is, uh, a very, uh, kind of streamlined, uh, history, uh, and there were certainly more bands than Black Sabbath, uh, involved in the genesis of heavy metal in the late sixties and early seventies. Um, but 
black, what black what Black Sabbath contributed um, was very representative of kind of some of the core themes of heavy metal. Uh, its sound uh, and uh, its sentiments moving forward. First off, Black Sabbath was uh, launched their career in industrial working class Birmingham, England uh, during the 1970s, okay, during uh, a time of social fragmentation and uh, disillusionment uh, and alienation uh, that came after the dream of the 1960s shattered in many respects. Uh, and what Black Sabbath did was uh, start started to focus on themes of depression, drug use, or the occult negative themes, themes of evil. Um, you know, something that was akin to the horror films they were watching at the time. Uh, and uh, more and more bands in uh, the UK and North America were uh, buying into this aesthetic, um, and a counterculture formed around it that focused as on being a haven for especially white working class social, socially alienated youth. Uh, and uh, there became this focus on transgression, on being, a, on being counter to mainstream society, a rebellion. A, and of course, metal is not unique in that respect. You know, the punk subculture was certainly a uh, similar uh, thing going on. Um, by the 1980s, we have what many refer to as the golden age of heavy metal uh, with the new wave of British heavy metal with bands like Iron Maiden. Uh, and this is really when metal starts to become uh, noticed uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the press uh, and throughout the world. Um, and so metal bands have firmly established themselves throughout Europe and North America and starting to go elsewhere. Uh, and this is where metal develops uh, into various subgenres, uh, including uh, various extreme subgenres where uh, they play faster, louder, harder, heavier, okay, more aggressively in vocals and instrumentation. Uh, and they're really pushing the limits of transgression, uh, of rebellion, of uh, adopting various symbolism that is designed to shock and to put people off. Um, but at the same time, there's also bands like Motley Crue and others that are uh, becoming representative of what we call glam or pop metal. Uh, and these are the bands that are get, especially getting attention in the mainstream media, because this is the time around 1985 when we have the origins of the Satanic Panic and the Parents Music Resource Center hearings, uh, in which essentially, like Socrates, heavy metal was put on trial for corrupting the youth. Eh? And there was a, a concerted effort uh, to suppress it. Eh? Um, but by but that heavy metal was there to stay by the middle 18, 1980s. Um, metal continues to develop and, and push the boundaries of extremes and uh, taking uh, themes of violence, murder, and uh, Satanism and anti Christianity uh, to new levels. Um, but at the same time, metal is also establishing itself uh, not just in the Western world, but also the global South, Japan, uh, Australia, New Zealand, et cetera. Okay. Um, by the late 1980s, uh, significantly uh, is a time when metal starts adopting themes of Western myth, history, and heritage. This is when bands like uh, Iron Maiden are writing about uh, Icarus and Alexander the Great. This is when uh, the Swedish band Bathory is starting to uh, adopt themes of, uh, of uh, Scandinavian heritage, okay, which becomes very influential. Um, by the beginning of the 90s is the rise of black metal and with it national socialist black metal, which we'll address momentarily. Uh, and just for the sake of completeness, we're to, to get up to the present day, um, by the late 1990s, early 2000s is uh, what some people call the uh, popularization or commercialization of metal with uh, the rise of genres like new metal and metalcore, uh, and uh, as well as the thriving of various power and folk metal bands. Okay, and these are specifically bands that often sing about history and mythology and fantasy. Um, and this is really the point where metal, uh, quote unquote, conquers the world when bands are establishing themselves uh, in uh, most countries throughout the world. Okay. Uh, and in the last decade or so, uh, this is a time when uh, um, I think we are experiencing a bit of a renaissance of uh, traditional heavy metal, 80 styles are in vogue again. Um, and uh, there's a lot of bands, out, uh, new bands out there playing old styles. Uh, but also at this time, I think is when metal is, uh, the scene is maturing and becoming more self-reflective, uh, certainly in the academic sphere uh, with the rise of metal studies, uh, conferences, books, 
journal articles, um, and even uh, academic programs at universities. Um, and it just in general, I think uh, metalheads uh, are becoming more self-reflective and critical of uh, problematic and toxic elements within, uh, within the art. Uh, and this is likely uh, the product, the consequence of metal also becoming increasingly diverse um, and uh, inclusive. Okay? And also uh, it's during this time we see the rise of anti-fascist metal, okay, which is uh, in direct response to um, some of the right wing bands that I'll discuss today. Okay, so again, um, there's on record uh, over 100,000 metal bands that have been around with recorded material since the 1970s. Uh, and today uh, there are producers and consumers uh, of metal uh, of all um, uh, races, classes, creeds, um, genders, et cetera. Okay. And so uh, the vast majority of, uh, of metal heads uh, are certainly, I would not call problematic people. Um, I am talking about bands in this lecture who are for, form roughly about 1% uh, of that. However, these are bands that are nevertheless um, influential in many regards. Okay. So uh, just to again, hammer that point home, uh, this is a very recent uh, map. Uh, of heavy metal bands per capita, essentially, or per 100,000 people. And you can see that, uh, you know, their metal is establishing itself throughout the world, but there's still the highest concentration, concentrations in, uh, quote unquote, Western countries. Um, and so that can uh, tell you a few things about um, compatibility with uh, and uh, with certain ideologies that I'll talk about. Okay, so uh, back to talking about metal studies. And basically what themes of heavy metal seem to feed into the phenomena that I'll, that I'll be describing. Um, and uh, this goes back really to one of the first uh, monographs uh, in the metal studies field. Uh, and that is uh, Heavy Metal, the Music and Its Culture by the sociologist, Dina you know, Weinstein. Um, and metal studies has largely moved beyond uh, a lot of Weinstein's uh, ideas. Uh, however, uh, this, one passage I think uh, continues to um, be quite informative. And this is uh, conveniently enough also when uh, Weinstein uh, appeals to classical mythology. Uh, and she essentially identifies uh, kind of the core ethos of metal as being a sort of ditheism of the gods Dionysus and chaos. In other words, a lot of uh, heavy metal musically and uh, thematically, lyrically, and in terms of imagery, um, is very Dionysian and then it celebrates, uh, you know, the irrational instincts, the rational animal side of human nature, okay, again, appeals to, um, you know, the, the passions rather than reason, okay, and certainly there is a form of rebellion there. And on the other side of that coin is uh, chaos, in other words, the negation of order, okay, uh, and the destruction of order, a okay, challenging uh, systems of conformity of control, whether they're political or religious or ideal ideological, and the various um, imagery that represents that kind of inversion of, uh, you know, mundane ordered existence. Okay. Um, another uh, major uh, theme of heavy metal traditionally has been uh, masculinity. Uh, and you can see that masculinity um, in this, uh, what had traditionally been a uh, majority male uh, culture, um, you know, is also intersects with uh, themes of medievalism and the romanticization of um, these sort of uh, hyper-masculine heroic figures from myth and legend, as well as fantasy literature. Uh, you can see that there is a lot, big influence of uh, the movie Conan the Barbarian with some of these. Uh, you know, these, these figures that appeal to, you know, patriarchal values of being a warrior um, and self-sufficient and uh, kind of also barbaric, uh, free from, uh, you know, the corruption of society and the decadence of society. Though at the same time, you can see that in contrast to that hyper-masculinity uh, is also uh, female figures uh, that are hyper-sexualized. Okay? And uh, these are often representative of some of the uh, sexism that is uh, in a lot of heavy metal 
uh, not just lyrics or imagery, but also you know the people making it, uh, and that is uh, something that is continuing to uh, be addressed uh, in the present day, but it still persists. Um, some of these uh, albums have uh, you know come out uh, more recently than others, uh, and uh, that and that phenomenon with, al with album artwork also uh, crosses over into classical reception. A, so we see, uh, and these are relatively recent uh, albums here. So the Chilean band Axe Battler, uh, you can see here uh, a heavy influence uh, of Conan the Barbarian, essentially that's uh, Perseus uh, in the guise of Conan. Um, but you can also see there's a heavy influence of Hollywood films, as we saw before. Uh, and we also see the hypersexualization of the feminine other okay, in Medusa there. And then on the right, uh, that doesn't need much interpretation there uh, with uh, the influence of the film 300 okay, appealing to the themes of masculinity. Uh, however, I would be remiss if I didn't point out that um, classical reception heavy metal does uh, indeed uh, from time to time uh, take inspiration from positive uh, feminine uh, figures uh, in uh, ancient history and myth uh, such as Boudicca and Zenobia. A, which seems to which suggests that um, you know classical reception does appeal to uh, women in the scene as well. And uh, what I'm doing here is uh, building on a lot of work that has been um, that has been put forth in the past decade or so. Um, there are literally thousands of songs that uh, are out there that have been uh, recorded since the 80s uh, that have various topics from Greek and Roman and Egyptian and Mesopotamian mythology and history, etc. cetera, um, by hundreds of bands. These include several concept albums um, and whatnot. And you can see there's, art, there's a, a growing body of scholarship by people such as myself and, uh, and others throughout the world uh, in various metal studies journals, as well as um as classics journals okay? and uh so i expect there to be plenty more coming out on this uh and uh some of these articles uh address um the reasons for why classical antiquity is so attractive to heavy metal bands and it has very much to do with again those core themes of uh of heavy metal in uh aggression transgression um empowerment, masculinity, uh, and uh, themes of resentment and aggression that appeal to, again, socially alienated youth that we've seen. Okay, so Osman Rumerhan makes that claim. Uh, Christian Gerslev uh, over in Denmark uh, looks at the reception of Alexander the Great as sort of this uh, idealized masculine figure who also uh, has a common narrative that uh, brings uh, disparate uh, groups together, okay, um, as well. And he also looks at um, how especially Greek bands look at Alexander uh, as an appeal to kind of a romanticized uh, national past. Okay. Um, also, um, uh, Helena uh, Gonzalez Vacariso, uh, I think sums up, sums up uh, this all best uh, in her article on the reception of Rome, masculinity, escapism, empowerment, and nationalism. They all come together and make uh, the, the classical past appealing, especially to uh, bands of Greek and Italian extraction. Okay? And again, that element of romanticism. Um, so uh, another uh, classicist, Chris Fletcher, has especially looked at uh, what we might call the development of Mediterranean metal. In other words, uh, bands from the, the modern Mediterranean uh, who are uh, adopting themes of ancient Mediterranean mythology and history into their music uh, as an expression of pride in tradition uh, and the nation. Okay, so there's Stormlord from Italy with their concept album on uh, Virgil's Aeneid. There's Wrathblade from Greece, okay, who have various songs from Greek mythology. Uh, and you can see again the hyper masculinization of Poseidon there. Okay? And there's also Melechesh uh, from Israel, okay, uh, who um, tap into Mesopotamian mythology. Um, also, uh, there's a lot of overlap between uh, the rise of heavy metal uh, and the resurgence of uh, 
of uh, neo-paganism throughout Europe in places like Greece. Uh, there's tens of thousands of people in Greece who are uh, now uh, adopting some form of worship of the Olympian gods. Uh, and these include metal bands as well, such as uh, Queer, who in fact uh, have several songs that are uh, hymns to various gods um, set to uh, the medium of black metal. So where does uh, this intersect with far right metal? Eh? Um, to get at that, we need to take a step back in time and go back to something I talked about in the history of heavy metal, which was Norwegian black metal. Eh? And again, this is a very simplified uh, approach, uh, but uh, at the beginning, at the very end of the 80s, beginning of the 1990s, uh, there was a, a group of young musicians in Norway um, who um, they looked at uh, kind of the metal that was coming out of the time. They thought, thought that this was becoming too commercialized, it was becoming too popular, and that they need uh, music that is more extreme, that really represents uh, their um, collective misanthropy and resentment um, and transgression. Uh, and so they formed black metal as a more streamlined, uh, atmospheric, lo-fi sound that would be inaccessible to pretty much anyone but themselves. Uh, but uh, it turns out that this actually became uh, quite popular throughout the world. Uh, and thematically, uh, these bands uh, take a more serious approach to, again, these themes of misanthropy, barbarity, uh, Satanism, and anti-Christianity. Um, whereas before, a lot of these themes had been, uh, had been used more as being transgressive for their own sake, uh, to be shocking for its own sake, uh, symbols of rebellion rather than commitments uh, to any certain ideology. Um, and also a big part of Norwegian black metal with bands, uh, with certain bands, especially bands like uh, Enslaved and Ulver, uh, was a, an element of the romanticization of nature okay, and nostalgia for pre-Christian pagan traditions. Again, uh, this kind of conservative turn of metal's transgressive nature is it's in its rejection of mainstream society. Uh, it appeals to a pure, uh, unadulterated past where uh, native one's native trad pagan traditions, uh, you know, uh, thrived before Christianity and other re uh, foreign religions, as they'd see it, came in and uh, supplanted those. And again, uh, the influence of Norwegian black metal on uh, heavy metal at large um, it cannot go unstated. Right? Um, another part of Norwegian black metal, probably most one of the more notorious aspects of it, that uh, is that uh, various members of this movement uh, took part in a series of uh, church burnings throughout Norway in the early '90s, um, and uh, a lot of people interpret church burnings simply as you know uh, drawing from commitments to Satanism and rejection of Christianity. Um, but scholars such as Miroslav uh, Rizal in the Czech Republic uh, connects. Uh, ideologically, a lot of these church burnings to uh, specifically uh, the uh, neo-pagan concerns, and uh, they are burning the churches as statements that, uh, you know, Christianity was this foreign religion that had replaced, um, you know, native traditions, and that uh, this was simply acts of terrorism in order to uh, make Christianity unwelcome. Uh, and the, one of the main instigators of um, these church burnings was a uh, musician named Varg Vikernes, okay, who is pictured in that uh, newspaper on the right. Uh, and it, Varg Vikernes took uh, this aspect of uh, black metal uh, much more seriously than a lot of uh, his other uh, bandmates and people in that scene. Uh, and the thing about Varg uh, is that uh, not only did he burn down churches, but he also uh, murdered one of his bandmates uh, and served uh, the maximum sentence in a Norwegian jail uh, for about, uh, about uh, 16 years, I think. Uh, and then he is now a free man and he lives in France with his wife uh, and he's still making music. And uh, Varg's uh, band Burzum uh, is one of the most uh, influential black metal bands, one of the most influential metal bands, period. But the thing about Varg is he's also um, a committed neo-Nazi. Okay? He has several publications through his website. He's written several books about paganism and their connections uh, to kind of a neo-Aryan, neo-fascist uh, type of ideology. 
Uh, and, uh, you know, in his various interviews, we see those, we, uh, we see how he connects that to classical antiquity. So for instance, in an interview from 10 years ago, uh, he basically said, claims that uh, the ancient Greeks were, you know, blonde haired and blue eyed. Okay? And uh, because of that, they produced great philosophy. Uh, but as soon as they started racial mixing, which is something that they had argued against, not sure where we got that from, uh, that's when uh, Greece declined into uh, how he saw ancient, how he sees modern Greece today. Uh, and that was 10 years ago, but uh, clearly he has not uh, changed his position one bit. Uh, he goes by fully in perspective on Twitter, and you can see on the left uh, a recent uh, post that he liked. Okay, which goes in with what he said in an interview, uh, as well as uh, you know, liking various pages, page, pages that celebrate uh, the uh, destruction of decadent civilization by barbarians, Germanic barbarians um, that he uh, embodies in order to kind of restore um, the proper natural order. Um, and while Burzum, Bars, uh, Van Burzum uh, does not really uh, treat classical themes uh, directly. It's more uh, focuses on uh, Norse mythology, okay, being from Norway. Um, he does incorporate some classical elements. So his uh, album from 10 years ago, Sol Austan Manivestan, okay, uses Olpiano Checo's uh, uh, painting, El Rapto de Pro Proserpina, a, uh, showing the uh, abduction of Persephone by Hades. And he basically uses this album uh, and incorporate, uses this uh, theme and incorporates it into his uh, kind of pan-European sense of pagan tradition, uh, allegories of um, death and rebirth um, and the, the cycles of nature. So this leads finally to uh, discussing uh, national socialist black metal. Uh, which Varg, which was, which essentially uh, took a lot of inspiration from Vikernes's activities uh, and his ideologies uh, and his writings. Uh, and so not long after Norwegian black metal, various uh, what's called NSBM bands uh, took root uh, in places like Germany and Finland and Greece and Poland and elsewhere. And uh, this is a type of black metal that, um, you know, wears its ideology on its sleeve. It adopts various, it mixes various pagan symbolism uh, with uh, Nazi symbolism, uh, such as uh, Celtic crosses and Thor's hammers uh, and black suns and various runes. Okay. Uh, and uh, most... Uh, NSBM bands, people tend to think of as being a very small minority of bands uh, that have very few listeners, but that is not the case. A lot of these bands, you know, especially in the age of the internet, uh, have sold, uh, you know, thousands of records um, and clearly have uh, a significant fan base. Uh, and one of those is Satanic Warmaster, uh, which is one of the most popular bands that uh, while uh, they uh, read they reject the label of NSBM, uh, clearly have uh, blatant fascist elements uh, in their lyrics. And as you can see on uh, from Facebook, uh, Satanic Warmaster has over 300,000 followers. Now, again, most of the vast majority of those followers are not card carrying Nazis. Okay? Um, what's going on here is we have a situation where uh, the majority of listeners are simply separating the art from the artist uh, and they're enjoying the music as music uh, and not uh, paying any attention to the lyrics uh, or to the ideologies that the artist might hold. Okay, so there's a, a fair, fair amount of tolerance by um, several people within the scene uh, that allows these uh, bands to continue to thrive. So, so let's look at some of the elements of NSBM politics specifically, and especially how they intersect with classical themes. Okay, so a lot of NSBM bands uh, romanticize Sparta, Macedonia, especially Alexander the Great, the Roman Empire, but also pagan and medieval Europe as ideal platonic states. Okay, so they create this sort of mythology of, um, you know, of ancient Europe, let's say, uh, as, um, as folkish states, uh, as uh, white ethno states, uh, as well as the original Aryan empires, quote unquote. Um, as we've seen before, uh, this music, uh, has plenty of appeal to irrational sentiments of anger, hatred, resentment, okay, but also national and racial pride. Um, the desires to reestablish natural heart and a race war 
uh, natural white race uh, will 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 uh, will claim victory. Um, there's also a lot of the rhetoric of victimhood um, and persecution complexes. Um, this is um, expressed often in the identification uh, of wolves, okay, as these sort of uh, lone wolves, uh, but also these wolf packs uh, that. Um, I can't. I don't have time to get into this, but uh, you know the symbolism of wolves is uh, is um, throughout heavy metal, okay? and it's not inherently problematic. Um, but often it is, uh, you know, is all it is something that is drawn on by these bands. Um, there's a lot of bands, especially singing about Sparta, wanting to reimpose uh, the laws of like Hergus um, of discipline, obedience, and eugenics, okay, much as the Nazis did. Um, privileging of patriarchal values and warrior codes again uh, appeals to. Uh, Homer's Iliad, okay, and the heroic code of, uh, you know, of Bronze Age warriors, okay. Uh, also, reconnection to the natural environment of Europe uh, and pagan traditions, okay. So often this, the rhetoric of the rebirth of the Roman Empire of Sparta comes with uh, the rhetoric of the Olympian gods or the Norse gods or the Slavic gods, um, you know, rising again and taking part in the uh, re reclamation of, of Europe from uh, the perceived invaders. Uh, and finally, this valuing of rural individualism and self-sufficiency, again, with these um, hyper-masculine models. So um, now we can get in a little survey of some of the bands um, that uh, incorporate this. So um, one of the original NSBMs, uh, scenes was established in Poland, a with bands like Graveland and Sunwheel and uh, Kataksu, um, and I'll especially talk about uh, Graveland, um, which is one of the most uh, influential NSBM bands. Though again, it is a band uh, whose frontman uh, Rob Darkin um, aggressively denies that he is an NSBM band, but uh, clearly his statements uh, in various interviews uh, suggest otherwise. Um, and again, he plays into this rhetoric of the rebirth of a pagan Aryan empire. And he has photos, uh, you know, posing with, uh, with neo-Nazis there. Um, and uh, one of the most uh, influential and uh, popular Graveland albums, and one of the most uh, um, popular uh, and influential albums in the black metal genre at large is uh, the album Thousand Swords by Graveland, in which there is a song where essentially, uh, you know, Darkin uh, sees himself uh, as uh, some sort of child who's cast into the elements uh, and really underwent uh, some uh, version of the Spartan Agoge, a, uh, which involved um, the killing of Christians, uh, my, very much like the killing of Pelots, uh, and uh, the Spartan way of life, a, uh, which uh, reflected uh, the natural hierarchy uh, being reestablished. Um, there's also a thriving NSBM, band, uh, NSBM uh, scene in France, okay, with bands like Black SS Storm, Seigneur Volant, and Peste Noire. Um, and uh, Peste Noire is, again, another uh, quite uh, influential and popular band uh, in the MSBM scene, uh, though again, a band that um, tries to resist that label. Um, they perhaps, they describe themselves more properly as national anarchists, so more libertarian far right than authoritarian. Uh, but you see here uh, in their lyrics, uh, an appeal to the warrior codes of say Homer's Iliad, where it basically says that uh, the Greeks thought that the ideal man was uh, someone who uh, based his happiness on his on proving himself superior to other human beings through um, you know through the through heroic deeds in war, okay? and then they envision the uh, return of uh, the ancient age okay, of berserkers of the Argonauts uh, who are blonde-haired, blue-eyed uh, to uh, reclaim their heritage and reclaim Europe. Um, another French band, uh, Black SS Storm, a, uh, also shows that um, these bands are not just looking at Hollywood uh, for uh, their models of class antiquity, but they are reading the ancient sources um, in depth. A, so uh, this band has a couple songs. Uh, first is uh, Jupiter Addication. Uh, and I focus on this song because uh, it essentially looks at Jupiter as this 
God who is going to take part in the uh, driving uh, the enemy, the perceived enemies out of Europe. And they specifically refer to him as our marble master wielding a thunderbolt. Um, and it's quite likely that they took inspiration from the statue of Jupiter of Smyrna in the Louvre in Paris. Um, and so this is sort of an example of uh, far right uh, individuals uh, in their ignorance and rejection of polychromy, um, the fact that uh, ancient marble statues were in fact uh, painted with all sorts of skin tones. Uh, they reject that notion um, or just are unaware of it. And they assume that, uh, you know, again, the ancient Greeks and Romans were white and they celebrated the beauty of white skin. Okay? And so they even, project, they even uh, conceive of Jupiter as looking exactly like he does in his statues uh, in uh, taking part in this reclamation of Europe. Okay? And then there's another song they write in French called uh, Dans les Yeux uh, d'Athena, where uh, they essentially see their, uh, their war and their effort against uh, uh, Jews and other minority, minorities. Uh, and they compare that to essentially Odysseus uh, coming home to Ithaca and slaughtering the suitors okay? uh, with uh, Clemence Ulyssienne there, okay? the Ulyssian clemency. Um, of course, I will also talk about uh, the NSBM scene in Greece um, with a couple of significant bands. Uh, and here is really where we see uh, a connection with uh, not only far right ideologies, but also far right parties. Okay, so uh, one black metal band in Greece, uh, which again doesn't subscribe to the NSBM label, but the lyrics say otherwise, uh, is Nair Mataran, okay, uh, who is. Uh, which is uh, led by uh, the individual on the left uh, who goes by the stage name Kyadas, uh, which is the name of the chasm into which the Spartans allegedly threw uh, disabled babies as well as um, traitors uh, and criminals. Um, but uh, that, is a, uh, that is turning out to be more of a myth than anything. Uh, it turn and uh, Naramataran uh, again writes uh, lyrics that uh, appeal to uh, this notion of the revenge of the Hellenic blood to drive out, uh, you know, Jews and Christians and these foreign invaders, okay, appealing to Alexander the Great, Achilles, and Leonidas as uh, models of warriors who fight wars against, uh, of both defense and offense against the East. And uh, the thing is, is that Caiadus is a stage name for a man named uh, Georgios uh, Germenis, uh, who from 2012 to 2019 served in the Greek parliament uh, as a member of the far right Golden Dawn Party, a, which uh, meets at Thermopylae uh, and celebrates the last stand of the 300 uh, every year on the anniversary of the battle a, uh, as a way of kind of recommitting to. Um, this uh, sentiment of, of against uh, immigrants. Um, also members of Golden Dawn are the members of the Greek NSBM band Der Stormer, okay, which is one of the most uh, influential NSBM bands uh, period. Okay. Um, as you can see, they took their name directly as well as a typeface from the uh, anti-Jewish newspaper of uh, Nazi Germany. Okay. So this is an NSBM band that certainly wears uh, on its sleeve um, their, uh, their neo-Nazism. Um, but as you can see here, they're not just a, a Hellenic nationalists, but they also uh, see their message as uh, trying to reach out to um, people, white people all, all over Europe. Okay. Uh, again, uh, connecting um, the heritage of the Greeks and the Romans to, uh, you know, to the Nordic and Slavic and, and Celtic traditions. Okay. And uh, their album artwork frequently uses uh, classical art, um, such as the uh, statue of Leonidas that's in modern Sparta. Okay. Uh, and they also have appeals to ancient Rome. Uh, so they have an, a split album that uses the, uh, one of the panels from the Arch of Titus uh, displaying uh, the triumph of the, of the uh, future Emperor Titus uh, in 71 CE after he uh, suppressed the Jewish revolt uh, and uh, sacked Jerusalem, destroyed the Jewish temple and uh, took away the great menorah as spoils, as you see here. Uh, and this arch uh, in Rome has been a uh, 
symbol of anti-Semitism in various forms uh, ever since. Okay. Uh, and also uh, one of their albums, A Bad and Greater in Death, uh, uses a photograph of the Nazi occupation of Greece in 1941, where they planted the Wehrmacht flag in front of the Parthenon, okay, uh, again, signaling this continuity between uh, classical Greece and, uh, and Nazi Germany. Um, and uh, I won't, I don't have time to get into this song, um, but essentially this is a, an example of a song where uh, they display uh, a reading of uh, Greek mythology and Homer's Iliad and other sources, and they rewrite myths in order to make uh, Apollo uh, into essentially the Aryan ethnic god from Hyperborea, okay, this uh, um, mythical uh, place to the north, uh, which was thought to be the, the original homeland of uh, the Aryan race. Okay. Uh, and then there's, of course, connections with Friedrich Nietzsche there, but again, I don't have time for this. Um, but you see that they have other songs uh, celebrating various uh, heroes of theirs, such as Antiochus uh, IV Epiphanes, okay, who was the uh, Seleucid king who, um, uh, who basically was overthrown or whose rule was overthrown by the Maccabean revolt. Uh, and this is a song essentially uh, praying for uh, Antiochus's revenge, a, and of course also songs that praise uh, the Emperor Titus um, as a uh, as an anti-Semitic icon. A, um, don't have time for that. Uh, one of their most popular songs is called "Those Who Lived and Died Like Heroes," a, and uh, just to show you that a lot of this music is freely available in various places, such as YouTube. Um, and you can see here, this is a, a fan uploaded this video and set it to stills of the music of the movie 300 because this is a song that essentially glorifies uh, the 300 and the song has been covered uh, by other artists as well. Um, and uh, when I took the screenshot was back in uh, February for a previous talk and it was already at over 31,000 views. Uh, I took a screenshot of it uh, yesterday um, and it had gained uh, about 3,000 more views. So in other words, uh, you know, this was posted in 2009, but uh, it is still getting uh, a relative amount of play uh, at what is somewhat of an increasing rate. Okay. Um, and if you see the interviews with their Sturmer, you see that, uh, again, they are very well read uh, in classics and philosophy, uh, which they put to the uses of ideology. Okay, so this is one uh, interview from 2007 where they're asked, uh, you know, what uh, individuals, philosophers have influence their ideology and they are pairing uh, Heraclitus and Plato with, uh, you know, the more familiar, um, you know, Nazi uh, philosophers, um, you know, certainly taking inspiration from Plato's Republic, uh, as well as Heraclitus, uh, which uh, I'll talk about in a moment, but of course also looking at various uh, uh, Greeks and Romans as their icons, such as Leonidas, Alexander the Great, Julius Caesar, and Marcus Aurelius. Uh, alongside figures uh, such as Prince Eugen and Otto Skorzeny and Vlad Dracula, who uh, drove, who were, uh, they see as icons of resistance against the Ottoman Empire, they paired with uh, Alexander and Leonidas there. Okay. Um, they're also looking at uh, mythological figures such as Odysseus and the semi-mythical uh, lawgiver of Sparta, uh, like Hergis, a seeing, seeing Odysseus as representing the cunning spirit of Aryan exploration and conquest uh, and seeing uh, Lycurgus's law code, uh, essentially establishing the law code of Nazi Germany. Okay. Uh, as well as other figures from classical Greece, such as Xenophon and Isocrates and Themistocles, uh, who represent either uh, offensives or ideological offensives against uh, Asia. Um, Another band uh, I'll talk about briefly is uh, a band that, again, is not often identified as NSBM, but this is an example of a band that um, definitely plays seriously with uh, fascist imagery uh, and rhetoric, and that is Spearhead, a band from the UK. And you can see here that uh, they certainly play with fascist imagery. We have actual fascies on uh, their album artwork. Okay. Uh, and uh, if you look at their most recent album called uh, Passivism is Cowardice. Uh, you can see this kind of militaristic spirit uh, and you can see they even wrote a proclamation uh, that is uh, on the uh, sleeve of the 
of, of the album where uh, they talk about kind of their ideology. Uh, they have appeals to Julius Caesar, to noble tongues, uh, and to kind of the Heraclitean notion that uh, war is the father of all. Okay, so uh, their connection there, and then using Latin to kind of signal uh, their you know connection to um, the classical world there. Um, and so you can see their engagement with um, ancient with Greek philosophy and literature um, in a song such as Polemos Patra Ponton, War is the Father of All, where they are engaging with various uh, fragments of the Greek philosopher Heraclitus, uh, especially the uh, fragment that says that war is the father of all and it makes uh, some people slaves and some people free. Okay? Uh, and also um, the response of Heraclitus to that line of Achilles in the Iliad that uh, wishing that war and conflict and strife would vanish from the earth. Uh, but since war is the father of all and that uh, you know, strife establishes the natural order of things, uh, he's essentially wishing that uh, the universe collapse. Okay. Uh, and most recently they have a song about the Crypteia of Sparta, uh, essentially this sort of uh, uh, Spartan secret police where they would uh, uh, ritually terrorize um, the uh, enslaved inhabitants of the Peloponnese is called uh, helots. Uh, and uh, you can see here they are essentially trying to embody uh, the Spartans in the song in their uh, taking the offensive uh, against uh, those they deem weak of limb and heart. Okay? But it's very interesting that uh, they have this line cast to Poseidon the weak of limb and heart. Uh, limb and, heart. Uh, and uh, it is not far-fetched to think that uh, these Brits are thinking of Brexit uh, in uh, and expressing perhaps coded anti-immigrant uh, sentiments uh, in uh, in this rhetoric. Right? Um, I won't to talk, talk too much about uh, Diocletian, but that is another band. Uh, this one's from New Zealand that uh, has um, lyrics uh, that were written by my, by uh, white supremacists. Um, so this is a song called Werewolf Directive, which was written by a uh, an American neo-Nazi. Uh, named Pete Helmkamp, uh, who wrote uh, a book called The Conqueror Manifesto, where he basically outlines uh, and argues for the supremacy of Indo-Europeans, uh, and uh, again, calling for um, this kind of resurgence of, um, of the white race to reclaim the world through an apocalyptic war. Okay. Um, and Diocletian itself, uh, the band, uh, you know, they certainly uh, play with a lot of uh, fascist symbolism, such as the Volsangel, okay, which was popular in Nazi Germany. Uh, and they also have, um, again, uh, the use of um, classical imagery in some of their uh, own songs uh, and, their, uh, uh, and their merchandise. Uh, so, you know, one of their songs from most recently is called Restart Civilization, where it essentially appeals to uh, King Romulus uh, as, uh, bidding iron beginning. In other words, uh, you know, uh, there needs to be this apocalyptic war so that uh, the natural order of human hierarchies can be reestablished. And then looking at Romulus as uh, sort of representing the reestablishment of Roman supremacy as a model. Uh, and you can see on a t-shirt here, um, we have the Capiline wolf uh, uh, with a black sun radiating overhead, um, which uh, very much may also signal some uh, fascist symbolism there. Okay, um, I'm almost done. So uh, how does this, so this is all kind of theoretical. These are bands that put out, you know, music uh, that, um, you know, some people would say is harmless uh, or can just be ignored. But uh, the fact of the matter is, is that some of the bands that I have talked about today, um, you know, have large platforms. Um, they are on label. They're on record labels that distribute uh, music globally. Okay, they're selling thousands of records and they are being put on festival bills. Uh, and perhaps one of the most recent kind of controversies within the world metal scene uh, revolves around uh, a uh, annual heavy metal festival in uh, outside of Helsinki, Finland called Steelfest. Uh, and uh, what happened was is they, uh, Earlier this year, they put out the announcement of the full lineup, and it uh, came to light that various uh, NSBM adjacent bands or bands that are, are clearly 
um, articulating fascist ideology or rhetoric or imagery uh, are being put on the bill. Uh, and there was a great backlash uh, to this announcement. Um, so I've underlined some of the bands that have some of those connections there, including Graveland, including Diocletian. Okay. Um, and of course, uh, you know, the organizers of Steelfest came out and you know denied that you know this was a you know this was a that their festival had anything to do with politics uh, or racist ideologies, but Clearly, in the past, uh, they have had other uh, NSBM and NSCM adjacent bands uh, play, okay, and to the, to, with the result that uh, you know fans at this festival felt emboldened uh, to uh, you know do Nazi salutes, uh, you know, in the front row. Right? Um, and while Steelfest, uh, you know, does not uh, market itself as, you know, a, uh, an NSBM festival, there are other festivals with uh, even closer connections to uh, fashion, to uh, uh, neo-Nazi organizations, such as the Osgards Ray Festival that happens in uh, every year in Kiev, Ukraine, uh, in which uh, bands like Der Stormer, okay, and Pest Noir, and others that I talked about today um, have played multiple times. Well, the thing about Arsgars Ray Festival is uh, it is essentially uh, run by uh, the record label Militant Zone, which is a NSBM record label, and that the members of that record label have close ties to the Azov Battalion, which is essentially a neo-Nazi paramilitary organization operating in Ukraine. Okay? So there is, uh, you know, so somebody could uh, you know, attend this festival and then, of course, and then uh, be exposed to this type of uh, recruitment. Uh, in the United States, there are also various neo-Nazi groups as well as, as throughout the world as well um, that have ties uh, to uh, black metal and NSBM, okay, such as the uh, Atomwaffen Division. Uh, so here is one of their leaders, John Cameron Denton, uh, wearing a Burzum shirt, okay, the band of Varg Vikernes. Um, we also see that, uh, you know, these organizations which have committed, uh, you know, racial violence and terrorism, um, you know, have connections to uh, NSBM as well. Okay, so this is uh, a photograph from a meeting of the Wolves of Vinland, okay, which is a group that has, uh, whose members have uh, burned down uh, black churches in Virginia. Okay. Um, also, uh, there was in 2019. There was there were multiple arsons of uh, black churches uh, in Louisiana uh, by uh, somebody who was uh, uh, pretty clearly emulating uh, Varg Vikernes uh, and uh, the church arsons of uh, Norwegian black metal. Okay. Uh, also, um, there's evidence that there is a connection between uh, black metal and the Charlottesville Unite the Right rally. Okay, so um, if you see the documentary Race and Terror by Vice News, you can see that uh, this is a scene of uh, various, uh, you know, uh, white supremacists uh, meeting and organizing the day before the, that rally. And you can see there someone wearing a uh, Burzum shirt taking part. Okay, and uh, you know, for this, I thank Benjamin Hedge Olson, um, who um, has kind of drawn all of this uh, evidence together to show these connections between um, this music and, um, you know, and uh, these organizations and their actions. Okay. Um, and again, the far right intelligentsia uh, has also uh, taken notice of this. Um, so, for instance, Jer the Jeremy, just yes. a couple of minutes, maybe. Can yes, you yes, almost, yes, thank yes, you. Yes, I'm almost done. Okay, uh, you can see that uh, Alex Rutacic, um, you know, recognizes in black metal, uh, you know, a potential soundtrack to the, what he calls the conservative revolution. Uh, you know, uh, NSBM uh, is uh, highly organized um, and uh, creates a cultural space in which, um, you know, these ideologies uh, have acceptance and then uh, other uh, far right groups can take inspiration from this. Okay? And again, he talks about, uh, how there is an appeal to sentiment uh, in this music uh, that is far more charismatic uh, than rational argument. Um, now, there's all this doom and gloom, but uh, as I mentioned in kind of my brief history of metal, um, in recent years, there has been the rise of sort of a counterinsurgence uh, in the subgenre of red anarchist and anti fascist uh, black metal and metal bands in general, such as uh, Throne Hammer. 
um, which have risen to prominence uh, and are gaining more and more acceptance in the metal scene, uh, whereas maybe 10 years ago, these kind of bands were kind of universally ridiculed. Okay. Also, back in response to Steelfest, we see, and in other places, we see more and more bands, uh, established bands, such as the, the Swiss band Samael, uh, taking uh, unequivocal stands against, um, you know, the infiltration of fascist ideology uh, in uh, to heavy metal. Okay, so Samael making a statement that they're pulling out of Steelfest once it once it had come to light that these uh, some of these um, far right bands were on the bill. Um, and we also see bands that are essentially trying to uh, squ to square their uh, sentiments of appeal to history and tradition uh, with uh, anti-fascist politics, such as the German band Atlantean Codex, uh, kind of market themselves as anti-modern, anti-urban, anti-fascist epic metal, okay? trying to see that there is a way that uh, you can uh, critique uh, modern uh, establishments uh, in kind of this capital capitalistic industrial present uh, without uh, resorting to um, you know far right conservative ideologies. So last bit here, um, just a few ways that we can respond. Um, and again, this is not an exhaustive list. Um, but first off, more than anything, be more mindful and critical of the art you consume and support. Okay, so. Um, you know, you if you are you know just playing this music, consuming this music, buying this music, you are giving money to individuals uh, who are um, you know potentially uh, acting within these organizations. Um, also, records labels, concert venues, review sites, music streaming and distribution sites—they are in their rights to deny these bands a platform, but also offer them a platform. Okay? And uh, they are going to make business decisions to um, that are right for them. And so. People need to persuade them that uh, you know, these they must deny these people these platforms, okay? Because what I'm not advocating is censorship, okay? I am uh, asking that private entities as well as individuals uh, make the choice uh, not to uh, platform these bands. Because the thing is, is that um, you know tolerating these bands, letting them compete in the marketplace of ideas is uh, is not enough. Clearly, these bands are uh, relying on the fact the majority of their fans are again, separating the art from the artist uh, and just listening, just liking their music uh, without necessarily buying into the ideologies uh, that it contains. Uh, of course, and then the next thing to do is, uh, you know, create a virtuous cycle of creating a more inclusive and equitable uh, music scene, okay, amplify and support uh, artists, journalists, and labels, and other professionals in the music industry, okay, especially for marginalized groups um, who unequivocally stand against fascism. Okay, again, uh, if you create a more inclusive spaces where people are more, uh, you know, aren't afraid to speak out against uh, these toxic elements, uh, then it'll encourage more inclusivity. Uh, and on the, on the academic side, this also, uh, we also, we should support and amplify the work of public scholars who communicate more accurate pictures of ancient Mediterranean society, especially um, you know, from margin, traditionally marginalized groups. Okay? Their voices, like their lives, matter. So that's it. I have a few people to thank, um, and uh, I will take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. And I, I ask you all to applaud, show your appreciation. Um, in whatever way you you wish, um, that was fantastic. I mean, it was it was wonderful to have um, such an inside um, survey and pinpointing of the of the issues and the challenges and the ways in which our our um, discipline and the ways we go about teaching it, talking about it, publishing on it can um, can work you know against the grain of some of the tendencies which as you say are only a fraction of a very popular genre and a genre that surprised me is is a very has some longevity i mean in in the last 50 years or so 40 50 years so um so what we'll do is um i'll moderate the q a so i think if you Put hands up is probably the best. Just see, go to the reactions button, and and I'll try and keep a track of that. I thought I would um, um, 
um, <clears throat> exercise my privilege as a as a introducer by getting us started with just a couple of questions, maybe, and one that interests me as a as a student of intertextuality is whether the anti-fascist metal groups that you mentioned early on, whether they uh, lyrically, textually, whether they take on um, some specific, some of the specific bands or at least the the traditional tendency that um, of some of the right wing groups. So whether there's a textuality that um, that emerges from that, which would be of interest. And then the other question, maybe related in a way, is you're you're stating that you know a lot of the even the white supremacist and and outright fascist um, groups have a following that enjoys the music without really attending to the lyrics. And as somebody who's a lyric person, um, um, as much as or more than a melodist person, um, just asking about that um, paradigm and whether in that connection, um, the populists are not the people on this Zoom session, um, but whether the sort of people like Prince Harry, who's not the brightest bulb of a fairly uh, dim, low wattage group, um, uh, and wear and wore a Nazi uniform, you know, which you know wasn't a great idea. But whether the ignorance maybe behind that, rather than the ideology, um, how we confront that, um, you know, when when our fraction of of those who will listen to what antiquity really is about, how, how um, skin color um, issues around statuary and so on. You know, what, what can we do in, in confronting that sort of uh, ignorance that, that might see, even if they listen to the lyrics, might see it as sort of harmless because they don't really understand historically the the racist and and catastrophic um, practice of the mid twentieth century mm -hmm. uh, that that racism manifested itself in. So those are a couple couple of thoughts. Is there any anti fascist intertextuality? And then and you touched on on the second one, namely what we can do and and I'm not sure what we can do in the larger world. But yeah, just to get things started, and I and I'll then keep record so. Uh, we'll go to Greg, Greg, Gregory Darwin, then Marios uh, Kutsukos, and then Alex uh, Papulias in that order. But I'll call on each of you. And I'm going to now um, uh, 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 allow participants to unmute yourselves. Don't unmute yourself unless you have a question, or please, because we'll get feedback and various other issues. So wait your turn, unmute, and then when I call on you, and then remute if you would, so. Yeah, um, so your first question, you know, I'll answer this briefly, um, you know, anti-fascist bands, uh, you know, some of them, you know, are, you know, they are engaging against fascism in their lyrics uh, explicitly, um, sometimes in, uh, comedic ways in order to kind of show these, uh, you know, these various right wing ideologies as sort of ridiculous. So there's, a, you know, there's this one band called Neckbeard Death Camp, which essentially, you know, kind of caricatures, uh, you know, the producers and consumers of this music. Okay, so that's certainly one tactic that they do to kind of confront this directly. And then there's other bands, uh, you know, that while their lyrics are, you know, sort of like Throne Hammer that I mentioned, where their lyrics are not, you know, uniformly anti-fascist uh they deal with other kind of other themes popular heavy metal such as you know sort of you know satanic rituals and whatnot uh but uh they are publicly uh you know make statements of anti-fascism and wear it on their sleeves like i said you know throne hammer has you know even their, their self patches okay that you know take that stand um and you know that's really kind of you know we're not asking that every band just constantly, you know, uh, sing we're anti-fascist, you know, we're anti-fascist, you know, we're just, what we're looking for is, you know, uh, you know, unequivocal statements uh, when a band, especially when a band contains, uh, you know, uh, statements or lyrics or imagery that can be, uh, you know, interpreted in various ways as suggesting this kind of stuff. 
um, you know, to, you know, uh, you know, not to kind of beat around the bush about that. A, um, and especially, you know, heartening to see bands that, uh, you know, um, you know, uh, taking themselves off of festival bills, you know, so that they would not share a stage with and support, you know, bands with these ideologies. Um, and yeah, and your, your, your other question talked about, you know, lyrics where, um, you know, uh, people are just ignoring them. And, you know, the thing is, is that, you know, you know, with especially the more explicit NSBM bands, you know, uh, people are aware that they're NSBM bands and they're still choosing to, you know, consume this music because again, they're prioritizing uh, the music over the lyrics because, you know, that's, that's, you know, that's what we naturally do. Um, you know, if the lyrics happen to be something that appeals to them, then that's sort of icing on the cake. And, but the other thing with metal is that, you know, especially with more extreme metal, you can't necessarily hear what the lyrics are saying. A, um, and that has two effects. The first effect is that uh, it allows people to ignore the content of the lyrics more so that they can more comfortably make this separation of art from artist. But it also can have the effect of, because they don't understand the lyrics, it encourages them to uh, look up the lyrics in order to kind of get uh, a more of a sense of kind of what they're consuming in total. Okay? Uh, and the thing is that, you know, I think in metal, you know, more than certain other genres, um, you know, a lot of people like to consume music by buy still buying CDs, buying vinyl records, rather than just, you know, streaming through Spotify or whatnot. Um, and metal's not the only genre where people kind of have this more traditional, you know, way of, of, of getting music. Um, and by buying those CDs and those records, you know, you, that's, they are coming with lyric booklets and whatnot, and they are more likely to, uh, to read those lyrics uh, if they have that physical media. Okay, so those are a couple, couple ways to respond to that. So I'll... Okay, great. Well, thank you. No, that's a, those are wonderful responses. I, uh, before going to our, our list, there are now four questions. Adrian, did you want to ask her as a, a co-chair? Did you want to ask a quick question? Or... No? Okay, that's fine. So Gregory, um, please, Greg, identi you. please identify yourself. Um, you know, just say who you are, where you're from, if you like, and then um, fire away. It's great to have, it was great for me getting all the registrations saying, I have no idea who 90% of these people are, um, but it's great to meet you all and, and, and to have such a diverse group here. So yeah, Gregory. Great. Uh, so can you all hear me, by the way? Am I audible? Great. Uh, different laptops, so the, the microphone is not fantastic, so it's always a little bit of a crapshoot. Uh, but form currently at Uppsala University, former graduate of the department, so uh, nice to be back here, even digitally. And just responding to one thing you said before I turn to my main question, you mentioned how the lyrics aren't often comprehensible because of the screaming and things. And a lot of NS bands do tend to sing in their own national languages as well, which I think kind of compounds that as well, because a band like Tim Nazar, which is singing in Ukrainian, you either can't understand that or you want to follow that up and then you, you know, might go down a certain rabbit hole. But I have a couple things popped up to me. The one that's probably the most pressing is you mentioned, obviously there's this articulation like a sort of European and a white European identity, but one thing that one term that was mentioned a lot of times was Indo-European specifically. Mm -hmm. And yet Finland is kind of a hotbed for this sort of thing. And mm -hmm. Finns don't speak an Indo-European language at all. I was wondering if there's any thing that you've come across in the depressingly large corpus that there is uh, that addresses this kind of tension. This might mm -hmm. not be a fair question because I'd imagine that this is probably much more likely to be addressed in lyrics in Finnish, which I don't know if you know or not. I certainly don't. It's a weird language. <laughs> no, I, uh, no that, that is a fair question. I'm glad you brought it up. Um, so, you know, again, the, the times I brought up in the lecture kind of this appeal to kind of this Indo-European sort of pan-European kind of whiteness, uh, you know, as the basis for like this Aryan empire. These are bands like Der Stormer, okay, and, uh, you know, and then those lyrics by Pete Helmkamp of An Angel Corpse, who is from the United States, uh, you know, writing lyrics for a band in New Zealand. Okay. Um, Finland, uh, I'm not sure if there, there's very little in Finnish um, 
you know, NSBM or, or black metal uh, that actually that actually uh, relates to classical antiquity. Okay? And so um, it seems that uh, when Finnish bands kind of, you know, veer into this territory, they're not, uh, you know, adopting a lot of the discourse of, um, you know, the, of um, fascist appropriations of classical antiquity, because they don't see that as sort of their, they don't, they don't, they don't see a, a connection to that to themselves. Okay, so, um, you know, they are probably, uh, you know, this is more out of, um, you know, nationalist sentiment rather than uh you know a kind of a, a pan-european one a okay. so good clarification there thanks Gregory thank you thanks for staying up late to to over there so yeah great thank you Gregory and um Marios you're next yeah uh, hello uh greetings i'm marius from the university of liverpool third year uh, phd student in classics uh thank you much, very much jeremy for this uh, very informative and uh, splendid talk my question would be in your opinion do you think it's uh, more uh, that the music draws in people to the ideology to far right ideologies or people who have already settled uh, in an ideology are drawn uh, to that music especially given the fact that at least in my experience i'm talking for the greek uh, metal scene and possibly the uk metal scene as well are people over 25 plus 30 plus so their political ideas are more settled so do they gravitate towards that music or is it the music that kind of uh, inspires them to adopt these ideologies thank you uh, that's a great question it's a it's a classic uh, chicken and egg uh, type of question uh, and um i mean that is something i would ideally want to quantify, um, but I don't think that's that's one, something you can quantify because I feel like it does go both ways that there are people who are, uh, you know, they're into the music. Uh, and again, you could you could see someone who's just like, oh, I really love Nocturnal Mortem. Okay? And I live in I live in 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 Budapest and oh, hey, they're playing this festival. Uh, you know, over in Kiev, I'm going to take a train, and then suddenly they are, you know, they are, you know, surrounded by people who are recruiting for the Azov Battalion, or, you know, and they're being exposed to these ideologies, and essentially they're finding themselves in groups that are kind of bombarding them with these ideas, and of course these are often very, you know, um, you know, demographically uniform groups. So you can certainly that is certainly a plausible kind of scenario there. Um, but as we also see with, uh, you know, um, people like Alex Kratatich um, and Greg Johnson, you know, is seeing that they're kind of just, they're looking at this music from the outside in with these preconceived ideologies and seeing how uh, it is useful uh, at the very least. Um, and again, um, I feel that both heavy metal kind of per se and these ideologies, um, they both have these appeals to sentiment and resentment. Uh, and as these sort of, uh, you know, these channels of one's aggression against society, right? Kind of the, the politics of grievance. Uh, and so heavy metal, uh, you know, is a create, cre has a culture that, that welcomes people who, you know, feel like they're outcasts and, uh, you know, are a place where they can sort of rebel against society. And of course, other, these groups of hard ideologies offer a similar thing. And so it is, seems logical that those things can overlap. Okay. So thank you, Marios. And Gregory, I look forward to seeing you both at, uh, at the Heavy Metal Conference. <laughs> thank you. Um, we're gonna keep going. We haven't heard a, a female voice so far this evening. So just to, if, um, anyone wants to get in line but unless Alex I shouldn't assume anything about Alex maybe but Alex you're next uh, I saw that uh, Jackie Young had a had a question here oh Jack yeah Jackie let's let's go a bit out of order just to have have um, some balance yeah Jackie and we'll get Hello. back to, we'll get back Hi, to Alex in a second Hi um, so, okay, I'm using a new device, so I hope that you can hear me. Um, in any case, Jeremy, thank you for this talk and thank you for doing the dirty work that now the rest of us don't have to do because it looked like that was a very unpleasant uh, set, of, set of research. I'm a, um, 
I'm an art historian at Yale and I specialize in the art and architecture of medieval Europe. And in my field, of course, we're also very uh, newly attentive to the white right wing appropriations and misappropriations of, of our imagery. What I'm wondering is um, whether in these NSBM groups that you've been talking about, whether they are drawn proportionately that much more to classical materials than to, to medieval ones? Are, are you just kind of like filtering out their references to other forms of uh, historical cultures just to look at the classical things? Or are these bands really gravitating toward Alexander the Great and the old Greeks and stuff like that more than like say the Crusades? Um, they are definitely drawn to uh, medieval themes just as much, if not more okay. than classical themes. So uh, okay. I, think, I think what I did tonight was I, I sort of gave, maybe didn't give that, give the, the right impression of kind of the proportions of reception right. because they, um, you know, for example, you know, I did a deep dive on Der Sturmer, they are Greek. And so they're going to focus on, you know, their heritage. Um, but, uh, you know, there's tons of NSBM bands that are you know, appealing to the Crusades, uh, singing about Frederick Barbarossa, yeah, uh, singing about Charles Martel, uh, mm -hmm. and all of these other kind of medieval to them heroes, uh, specifically right. those who, you know, take the fight uh, either defensively or offensively against um, the, against the East as they perceive it. Oh, right, right, right. Um, okay. So yeah, but medieval imagery is all there. And again, medievalism in metal uh, is, uh, you know, widespread uh, and has also right. been studied by medievalists who are also metalheads, sure. such as Shama Boyarin. And then there's a, mm -hmm. uh, a metal, the metal and medievalism uh, uh, edited volume out there uh, that right. is this as well, including um, its, um, intersections with with right-wing ideologies um but right. essentially you know what i see is you know metal itself um you know is just very fascinated with pre-modernity in general as a concept right. a mm -hmm. uh you know it's a natural in rejecting modernity okay pre-modernity becomes mm -hmm. appealing as something mm -hmm. where uh you know this is where often this is where authenticity is Okay, this right. is where you know humanity was before all of the current problems that they perceive uh, you know kind of ruined everything okay, which is of course not uh, you know, what everybody in metal thinks uh, but right. they, nevertheless there is this sort of you know I mean it's why we study classics or you know yeah. the musical world there is this magnetism of it that draws us to it and I think that same magnetism is is present in you know, bands throughout the world who are receiving this material. Okay? And again, the vast majority of these bands receiving this material are not, um, you know, harnessing it for ideological purposes. Sure. And see these kind of empowering uh, and uh, just sort of fantastic elements. Okay. There's this sort mm -hmm. of escapism to this, to this other world as, uh, you know, is in their kind of, you know, um, antipathy to the present. Good. Even if they're so electrified, which is it's so hence the need for this conference that you're organizing, which I look forward to. Thank you, Jeremy. Yeah. And again, I look forward to your participation as well. So uh, yeah. Thanks. Thank and Jack, I'd like to say that Jackie, um, we'd love to get you involved with this seminar. It seems to me, just observing things in the last couple of years, that the medievalists in some ways are not capitulating or assenting to the characterization of their field, but coming closer to doing that. Yeah, we, um, and, mm -hmm. you know, the, the consequence of which seems to me is abandonment of the field. Um, mm -hmm. So rather than showing that it's a certain reception, which is not necessarily um, identical with the field itself. And so that right. I think right. medieval studies is, um, is at an interesting to use that that word um <laughs> okay. but, uh, let, i'm conscious of the time that was a great yep. question but i'm gonna go with mike and then i'm gonna read alex who's having a problem with his mic and then james and blau and i hope we i think try and keep your questions shortish and and jeremy your responses succinct so we can everybody who wants to put a question in can do so 
Mikan, if, if that's the right pronunciation. It is, thank you. Um, so I'm doing my PhD at the University of Bristol. I'm, um, I'm working with Roman Egypt. I do a lot of research on ethnicity in Roman Egypt. Um, I've also done some work on Orientalism in um, the, the driving force of Orientalism in the reception of antiquity in computer games. So I am quite into reception studies as well. Mm -hmm. um, so one thing I find is that there is obviously a lot of scholarship on ethnicity in antiquity. And one thing we are increasingly finding is that ethnicity is primarily a performance and people can negotiate their ethnicity in different contexts. So, so ethnicity can be multi-layered, it can be uh, subject to negotiation, it can be quite fluid. Um, and I think we as scholars are becoming quite aware of that. But I find that for people of the general public, they, they don't really seem to be very engaged with the theory behind all this. And I, and I suppose my question is, how do we as scholars, how do we as scholars make this kind of research more accessible to the general public? So I think the, the anthropological theory is well published as well studies, but I don't think most people find it accessible. So people like musicians who aren't necessarily scholars, they might not even engage with those kind of books and that sort of research. Yeah, and uh, you know, this is something I'm uh, I'm, I'm I'm researching currently. Is you know, uh, you know, the bands I looked at today, you know, are what I was trying to demonstrate is you know they're not just getting they're not just like John Schaefer who are getting their you know conceptions of Sparta or antiquity from Hollywood. Hey, um, they are you know they're reading the original sources. Um, they're not necessarily reading the current theory. Uh, I assume they I assume they don't. Uh, you know, and the most up to date scholarship, especially on topics you know of you know race and ethnicity, uh, as you described. Um, but but yeah, again, uh, you know, a lot of bands uh, do um, consciously, in fact, uh, you know, take on from Hollywood and popular culture these imagery of antiquity because they find that it is more compatible with kind of the heavy metal ethos uh, in many ways, uh, you know, in the, something I tend to bring up a lot is, uh, you know, in the liner notes to the Bathory album, Blood on Ice, K, which was put out in, I think, 1996, uh, Corthon, you know, of Bathory wrote that was kind of reflecting on, you know, the point at which he transitioned from kind of the satanic and occult themes of, you know, first wave black metal in the 80s to the Viking metal that he started producing, you know, in the later 80s and moving forward. Uh, and he basically said that, uh, you know, the imagery that appealed to him that he put into those lyrics and those albums was, you know, not like the historically accurate, you know, you know, conceptions of Vikings that you get from from academics, but it was actually, you know, the Hollywood imagery of, of Vikings uh, and, you know, that we even see today uh, that he found more appealing. Uh, and so even though he was just like, you know, I'm Swedish and these are my ancestors, I'm still going to play into, you know, this, this, this kind of pop, pop culture discourse, which I find, uh, which, I, uh, which I find fascinating. And I'm going to look more into this sort of knowing it's not right, but nevertheless, it's uh, for the sake of the aesthetic, a, we are going to continue perpetuating this imagery um, that clearly, you know, the scholarship is not, um, you know, is, 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 you know, pointing out is not accurate. Um, yeah, and yeah. to get to your question about, um, you know, how do we articulate, you know, this, uh, you know, these things. And I think it's just uh, uh, in reception studies, especially um, in the field of classics, medieval studies uh, and um, elsewhere, you know, historians, classicists, you know, literature people, um, I think this is kind of a golden opportunity um, to, you know, get into that body of, of scholarship and those kind of methodologies and then uh, working on it as public scholars, a, um, you know, and I think that's how you engage with the public because the public's conception of, you know, antiquity or the medieval period, okay, or other, um, or other things is, um, you know, is what's most familiar to them. A. Mm. Um, and so I feel, so that's kind of what I'm doing here is like, you know, uh, heavy metal is something that is, you know, it's, it's, it's a well-established form of popular music. A, and it is playing with this imagery of drawn from 300 and Grat Gladiator and everything. And, you know, putting out a talk, okay, or putting out, you know, a blog post uh, or some kind of piece of public scholarship that uses that imagery and engages with it is, I think, 
you know, going to resonate with a wider audience uh, and kind of use the reception of the of this material as sort of a, you know, uh, as an interface in order to introduce them to, you know, what are the, what is the more accurate understanding of the material, you know, rooted yeah. in, in current scholarship. Is that, was I, is that uh, kind of what you're getting at? Yeah, I, I agree. Thank you. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you, Mike, and thank you, Jeremy. Um, you can all see Alex's question in the chat, but I think we'll we'll look at that, hold that. But maybe Alex, if you're okay, we'll go to James and Blau and come back to that um, your written question at the end, which takes us away from into uh, takes us into other forms of pop culture, which are very interesting. But let's stay with Jeremy's. Um, primary uh, research and, and paper first. Yeah, so James. Hi, I'm from a very different background than the rest of the folks asking questions here. I'm an undergrad at Ohio State, as you might be able to see, I'm actually from Cincinnati. Um, I was wondering um, about 20, probably more like 10 years or so prior to the birth of the NSPM movement, there was the uh, in Britain, the rock against communism subculture. I was wondering if any of these NSBM bands took influence from the rock against communism movement. Uh, absolutely, um, definitely. Um, yeah, it was not. Yeah, and I and I think and I'm glad you brought that up because that is you know you know Varg Vikernes and the Norwegian black metal was not the sole influence on this music. Hey, um, it supplied a lot of the aesthetic. It supplied a lot of the um musical elements um uh as well as ideological elements in many respects um but there is certainly also influence from um from those earlier movements uh you know especially given the immense crossover um between uh punk and heavy metal you know influencing the development of thrash metal which was uh essentially a forerunner to death metal and black metal a um so some of the bands that I have uh, looked at, um, you know, do begin as RAC bands uh, and then develop into NSBM bands uh, or otherwise that are, you know, even uh, incorporating classical themes. So for instance, uh, there is uh, a band in Poland, okay, that began as an RAC band uh, called, um, there's two bands and one of them's RAC is either one is uh, called Tormentia and one is called Hammer of Hate uh, and they have songs about um, the Battle of Thermopylae uh, and in a Polish context and they one of them sings about the uh, the Polish Thermopylae in fact which was um, you know a last stand uh, uh, against actually Nazi Germany which is kind of ironic right um, so yes I'm glad that you you did bring bring that up to to provide some more context here. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. And I might just, uh, again, that so Thermopylae seems to get used and reused as it was used by the Nazis. And then um, are the Punic Wars, the Nazis famously used the Punic Wars, a defeat by the Occident of the Semitic um, Punic um, enemy, Carthage. Um, does, that, uh, does that get activated? Uh, yes. Um... I don't see it so much in like explicitly, um, you know, far right bands, um, but there's certainly the Punic Wars are a popular theme in the reception of Rome in general. Um, and it could come from, you know, um, you know, right wing or nationalist sentiments, certainly uh, plenty of bands in Italy, um, you know, sort of connect those things, uh, not necessarily in, you know, a you know, a neo-fascist way. Um, I think one of the main examples I think of is, uh, in fact, this is one of the most well-known uh, ancient history themed metal bands today is the Canadian band Ex Deo. Okay? And there is essentially the uh, band is run by a Canadian, uh, uh, an Italian Canadian named Maurizio Iacono, okay? who is, uses this band essentially to reconnect with his Italian heritage. Uh, and his Roman heritage and, uh, you know, and he has a concept album on the Punic Wars. Um, and uh, if you watch music videos and everything, uh, you know, there's clearly, uh, you know, uh, a very idealized, uh, you know, 
uh, look at the Romans. Um, okay. And I won't speculate, you know, what uh, his political views are, but, you know, he does, you know, have coffee mugs that say make Rome great again. And it's hard to tell with heavy metal, you know, how seriously to take that. Okay, because another yeah. thing about that sort of complicates this whole analysis is in heavy metal, especially is, you know, uh, this kind of tongue in cheekedness of a lot of metals sort of hyperbolic uh, use of various shocking imagery. Um, and that's often used as sort of a defense of some of these bands being like, oh, I use this image, but I'm just using it for shock value rather than as a reflection of any ideological commitment. Uh, yeah. And so that gets, that gets a, that's a very thorny issue that I uh, didn't have time to get into. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, and I think it's hard to imagine a make Rome great again thing not being slightly ironic and even anti-Trump uh, in a sense, in its yeah, human way. Right. Good. So um, let's go with uh, Blau Fare. Blau, would you? Um, hi. Um, well, first of all, thank you so much for this conference. It was really interesting. I'm also an undergrad student. So, um, well, I just thought that it was curious uh, what you said in the beginning that the conservative parties or right wing use this rage filled side of metal to kind of justify their actions or their intentions towards, you know, refugees and these well, behaviors. Mm -hmm. But I think this spirit in black metal music, this rage is something that you would at least initially associate or that would kind of share similarities with left wing as mm -hmm. in for the protesting side of, of these ideologies or, well, yeah. So I guess my question would be, how do you, or how do they connect this expression of rage to what these ideologies really aspire to, which is, you know, a calm, controlled kind of society, which, for example, as in eugenism, would not let anything slip out of this perfection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, I think you're getting at into some of the contradictions that, you know, uh, exist in this, uh, you know, in SBM and, and similar types of, of metal is that, uh, you know, uh, and then uh, Benjamin Olson, uh, you know, wrote an article about this kind of showing how most black metal, you know, um, he argues, you know, they reject, you know, NS ideology and whatnot, because it is, uh, it goes against, you know, sort of their concepts of individualism, where, you know, that's very, uh, a rejection of any system of um, conformity and control or law and order. A, um, and they were, and again, this is why satanic imagery, you know, is so rampant in black metal is to kind of represent that uh, sort of, you know, hyper individualism in that regard. A, and getting at to what you said about rage is, you know, um, you know, the, you know, you can basically, I, I see metal as uh, appealing to people who have any sort of uh, visceral resentment against the status quo or to kind of various uh, economic, political, religious uh, institutions that predominate in their society. And uh, that anger, that resentment can go in multiple directions, okay? It can go, it can lead them further left to the far left, it can lead them to the far right or somewhere in between. Uh, just not where no, nothing just just not you know there's not really much centrist metal out there you know as you can imagine um, so you know the politics of resentment uh, can be it really is a matter of where is that anger directed against okay is it directed against uh, institutions and people who are powerful and privileged okay or is it directed against various scapegoats uh, who are really you know not at fault and nor are they powerful, but they are perceived as, you know, um, being the cause of um, you know, various, you know, economic or political uh, issues. Right. Does, does that, that's a wonderful question, as, as Jackie said, and I agree. Does that account for its durability, the durability of the genre in a way, and that our polarity is, has been the name of the game since uh, Reagan and Thatcher, uh, which is about when this all starts, right? Yes, yes, definitely. Um, uh, did, okay, ja um, Jackie, I, is your hand just left up or did you have a second question? Um, 
If so, we could get to that after. You want to quickly address Alex's um, question, uh, Jeremy? I, I can read sure. it if you like. Uh, right. Yeah, sure. Did you see it? Uh, yes, I see it here. Um, yeah. So okay. Jackie put her hand down. So this may be the last question, but if people if people do have further questions, um, uh, put your hand up before we wrap things up. But yeah, um, you're all yours, Jeremy. Okay. All right. So this question asks, uh, you know, uh, that uh, Alex is whoopsies. Uh, curious uh, about how much interplay and back and forth there has been between the fascist and white supremacist scene with other forms of pop culture, such as material like comics and games, such as material like the British 2000 AD or others. Would these help act as entry points? Do you know of any good place to get research? Um, it's certainly there. Again, this is not, uh, I'm, at the moment, I'm kind of looking at Hollywood as supplying a lot of this, but there's also a lot of influence on just heavy metal in general from comics and video games, as well as uh, various types of popular literature like fantasy literature, H.P. Lovecraft, Robert E. Howard, um, et cetera, um, that are, you know, that are um, serving as, as, as entry points uh, here. Um, and in terms of just kind of the, the classical material, you know, there, I can imagine that there's a fair amount of people who are playing games like Rome Total War, um, you know, that are, um, you know, that are using those as entry points as well. Again, uh, and again, a lot of these pop culture kind of forms of reception that, you know, were appealing to metalheads are the ones that focus on, you know, uh, great men you know, quote unquote, like Alexander the Great and Caesar, as well as military history, okay, which is presenting a very distorted picture of, you know, all there is to learn about the classical past. Um, you know, and that's a lot of the picture that is painted by, you know, not just far right heavy metal bands, but a lot of, you know, metal bands in general who receive classical antiquity, though certainly there are other uh, topics that are covered. Okay, so that's, <laughs> but yeah, there's, uh, in terms of like places to begin research, um, you know, I'd have to, I'd have to think a bit to compile a, a few, ask around a few people. Okay, great. Well, so I apologize. Uh, something happened to my connection about a third of the way through, but I hope, I hope that the technical people can, can sew together the two parts and that the recording will, will come through and eventually end up on the classics department site and the Mahindra site. Um, and, and then on, YouTube, again, a free site there for those who came in late. And um, I would just like on behalf of Adrian Staley, who's here and John Hamilton had to leave, he had something at six, but just to thank Jeremy for a wonderful presentation and very informative for those of us, my taste, some of you know are in Bob Dylan, um, who's also very, has uh, even more uh, endurance maybe than metal, but, um, but it's a very different uh, thing and it's wonderful to be informed. Um, and in a way for us, even those of us who don't follow the genre, but to be informed as a means of pushing back and, and the enterprise of understanding, not just our field in its ancient past, but in its reception as should always, I think, be part of our task. And Jeremy has helped greatly uh, for this very important aspect of it. So thank you, Jeremy, and um, all of you who uh, come back again for another of these. We'll um, keep your eye on uh, Mahindra Humanities Center, a seminar on uh, ancient uh, classical traditions and receptions. And so with that, um, farewell from us and thank you, Jeremy. So. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Adrian. Thanks everyone for coming. Um, this is uh, this was uh, delighted to be here again. Good to be home. <laughs> Thanks everyone.